Before coming to the Jackson Institute, it's true, I did serve at the Department of Homeland Security for more than two years, and I worked closely with the Secretary and, and got to know her well. I, I'm, I'm often asked, uh, what is she really like uh, in private? Uh, so for the purpose of today, <laughs> I thought I would mention uh, two traits that uh, are not always on display in public. One, she is a tremendous sports fan. Uh, enthusiastically adopting the local sports teams where she finds herself living. And second, she is very, very, very competitive uh, in all facets of her life and her work, uh, and including her support of the local sports teams. So in the spirit of a warm welcome to the Jackson Institute and Yale, uh, I would just like to point out Madam Secretary, that the Yale Bulldogs trounced Georgetown uh, a couple of weeks ago in football. Yeah. So I'm just saying. These things happen. Yeah. I think I may have just been added to the no fly list. <laughs> um, the, the Department of Homeland Security uh, was created as a response to the September 11th terrorist attacks. More than 20 federal agencies uh, were hastily brought together uh, under one roof. And when it opened its doors on March 1st, 2003, the department was at once the third biggest department in the federal government with more than 250,000 employees. It had to quickly consolidate into one unified department uh, near those nearly two dozen uh, agencies, each with their own legacies, their own set of cultures, and their own way of doing things. And it was given five missions crucial to the safety and security of the United States. Prevent another terrorist attack on our soil. Prevent uh, a devastating cyber attack on our critical networks. Protect our nation's borders. Enforce the country's immigration laws. And prepare for and respond to both human cause and natural disasters. And by the time Barack Obama was elected president and asked our speaker uh, to be his Secretary of Homeland Security, many were openly questioning the department's value. Was it too large and too cumbersome uh, for its own good? FEMA had become, in the wake of Katrina, uh, the very symbol of bureaucratic failure. The color-coded alert system that played in airports was helpful pretty much only to late-night comedians. And the, the employee morale at the department was, was at the bottom of all federal agencies. But those who worried that the department couldn't be fixed, or who thought the spirit of its employees couldn't be rallied, or who wondered if the department was just too big for one person to lead, never met Janet Napolitano before. She was the two-term governor of Arizona, called by Time Magazine as one of the five best governors in the country. She had been the Attorney General for Arizona and the U.S. Attorney before that. First woman to be chair of the National Governors Association. Today she has led a complete and total transformation of the department. She has been tireless in her pursuit of better, more innovative, more effective strategies to protect the homeland. There are more resources guarding our borders than ever before. Immigration enforcement is smarter and at record highs on her watch. FEMA is now a symbol of responsiveness, and its work has been praised by governors of both political parties from all across the country. And those color-coded threat warnings have been replaced with a system that communicates real threat information in real time and places its trust in the American people. It is my great honor to welcome to the stage for a discussion about the international aspects of Homeland Security, someone who has been praised as the most competent public servant in government today and the rock star of the cabinet. Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano. <laughs> well, thank you. I don't know about that rock star thing. Oh. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be uh, up here at Yale and to see uh, all of you and to be uh, here at the Jackson Institute. I appreciate the, the invitation. Uh, I am going to uh, keep my remarks brief and I'm going to speak about the international aspects of Homeland Security in part because uh, that component of our work is often counterintuitive 
but uh, uh, as Jim said, I, I really want to leave most of our time uh, for questions and dialogue with the students here, so I will speak uh, briefly. I'm often asked when I say I'm going to speak briefly, uh, they look at me and they say, you know, Janet, um, you're a lawyer and you, you're a politician. What exactly does that term mean to you? And, and I will relate a story told to me by Mike Huckabee, the then governor of Arkansas, who tells the tale of the writing professor who said he would give the highest grade to a student who wrote the shortest story containing four fundamental elements. And the four fundamental elements were religion, royalty, sex, and mystery. Religion, royalty, sex, and mystery. And the highest grade went to the following. Um, oh God, said the queen, I'm pregnant and I don't know who did it. <laughs> so, in, in, in the spirit of that, you can all use that story, I don't care. Um, uh, I want to speak with you about uh, the fact that homeland security is really national security, and that homeland security is really international uh, in nature. Uh, and to do that, I want you to travel with me back in time to Christmas Day of 2009. Uh, I was actually uh, at my brother's house out in the Bay Area. The president was in Hawaii. Uh, and uh, we got a secure call. By the way, when you're, when you're out doing your Christmas Day walk uh, and your Secret Service agent comes to find you and says you need to make a secure call to the White House, you know that's not going to be a good call. I mean, something, has, something has happened. And the something uh, that had happened was an attempted terrorist attack on a Detroit-bound uh, flight, Flight 253 out of Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam, uh, to, uh, to the United States. Um, and although uh, that flight was a U.S. flight carrier flying into a, a U.S. city, it actually involved passengers, if this uh, had succeeded, passengers from some 17 different countries who would have perished. Um, the alleged attacker was a man named Umar Farouk Abdu Matalab. Uh, he was a Nigerian citizen educated in the United Kingdom. He received training on terrorist tactics in Yemen. He purchased his ticket in Ghana. He flew from Nigeria to Amsterdam before departing for Detroit. He was in Canadian airspace when he attempted to blow up the aircraft using explosive known as PETN that he had packed in his underwear hence the name he's been given, the Underwear Bomber. He's on trial today, by the way. His trial just started in, in Detroit. He was unsuccessful, not because he didn't uh, evade uh, the layers of security that we have, but because uh, the passengers on the plane noticed something amiss with him and uh, went over and put out uh, the detonation device before it could actually detonate the explosive. If he had been successful, he had enough PETN uh, on his body to probably take down the entire aircraft. Uh, that, um, my friends, is a homeland security problem. Uh, it's a homeland security problem. Why? Uh, because uh, it illustrated that information that we had in databases possessed by customs part of Homeland Security uh, needed to be shared overseas at last points of departure uh, where we have air carriers and air screeners, uh, part of the TSA, also part of Homeland Security, that we couldn't just view uh, the world's oceans as a, uh, a free zone. Uh, it was international in nature because it revealed that once you get into the world's aviation system, you potentially have access to all of it. Uh, and if you have access to all of it, you have access to all of it for purposes of blowing it up. Uh, you have access to all of it for purposes of terrorist travel. Uh, you have access to all of it for other nefarious reasons as well. Uh, and once we, once we got through the immediate crisis of the moment and we realized that Abdel Matalab was 
Uh, there weren't others out there on other flights, and we, we got our, 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 the setting back. We got, our, uh, got, the, got this thing back under control in that sense. Uh, we took a step back and said, you know, this really is a global aviation issue. Uh, it's not a homeland security issue. And so we began reaching out to institutions like the United Nations, which has a civil aviation organization under it called the ICAO. Uh, and, and rather than putting together a U.S. initiative uh, around the world, we went into partnership with ICAO uh, and set up regional summits around the world. Uh, and we had to move quickly because we realized that the level of security at airports around the world, it needed to quickly uh, be improved at every number of levels. Uh, we had over the course of, I think, five or six months regional summits in uh, Spain, uh, Tokyo. Uh, we had regional summits in Abuja, Nigeria, uh, in the UAE, and in Mexico City for the Western Hemisphere. And it all culminated in an international uh, meeting uh, in Canada nine months after the fact, which is record time for the UN, by the way. Um, that's normally by the time they finish their first draft of a document. Uh, but we were bringing it uh, to the entire uh, national uh, body, international body, and getting agreement uniformly among the nations of the world on what needed to be done within nine months. Um, that was all international work done under the rubric of homeland security. I'll give you a second example of the international nature of our work, and it also involves air travel, not surprisingly. Um, but one of the key tools that we have uh, in terms of protecting uh, the United States, both from acts of terrorism or uh, other international crime, uh, is to know uh, travel patterns and how uh, people uh, are traveling and where and what routes they have taken, uh, and to be able to search for travelers based on their travel patterns, based on those travel routes, uh, and to do so in, in a way that allows us to get as much information about travelers 72 hours in advance to increase the likelihood that we are going to find somebody. Uh, we and. Uh, we process almost 2 million passengers a day in the United States. We have the largest, most complex aviation system in the world. Uh, that involves reaching agreements across the globe, uh, including right now negotiating one with the European Union. Uh, and what's interesting there is that gets you into, for those of you that have studied the EU or are, they are a different regime now. They have something called the Lisbon Treaty, uh, the Lisbon Treaty gives the European Parliament basically approval authority on international agreements, even those involving security. Uh, and so we are in the process of working with the European Commission, the Council of Ministers, and we will be going to the Parliament uh, trying to draft a, an agreement on how we get advanced passenger information from the EU and exchange it back. And how we do it not for particularized persons for which we already have data and reasonable suspicion, uh, but how we do it systemically so that people who meet certain uh, uh, parameters uh, can be pinged against the system for at least a secondary um, examination. So that's uh, number two. Uh, a third way that we are uh, intersecting internationally uh, is in the entire area of the protection of our nation's intellectual property uh, and the protection of our nation's cybersecurity. Uh, the cybersecurity area, as you all know, uh, respects no national boundaries. Uh, uh, it has no laws, no international protocols or conventions govern it. Uh, it is really a free-for-all in cyberspace. Uh, and that means attacks, intrusions uh, can come from anywhere in the world and cause massive damage, uh, massive damage not only to uh, the government but also to the private sector and particularly the private sector that controls our nation's infrastructure. Uh, and so we are just, I believe, at the beginning of understanding what needs to be done to really protect cyberspace in the non-military uh, environment. Uh, but that is something that uh, responsibility that we have at the department uh, and that I think we will be retaining uh, even as uh, uh, 
the Congress begins to draft the law governing um, authorities. Uh, and that means uh, that we consistently have to be looking around the world and thinking internationally with respect not only to how we protect the country in, in, in cyberspace, uh, but also how we protect the nation's economic health uh, from threats and or from thefts, excuse me, uh, that are cyberspace dependent. Uh, and that, of course, is international in nature and involves us in some very tricky questions. So what are some of the issues that arise uh, in this uh, environment? Well, where does Homeland Security end and national security begin? Uh, I believe they are intrinsically and inextricably blended. That's a question. Uh, what is the role of the Department of Homeland Security vis-a-vis -vis the State Department, vis-a-vis -vis the Department of Defense, vis-a-vis -vis some of the other larger departments of uh, the federal family? Um, that uh, it sometimes gets worked out on a situational basis. It's not easy to, to draw bright lines and organizational charts that anticipate every eventuality. Uh, how does the Department of Homeland Security uh, ensure that homeland security equities are taken into account when decisions are being made in the interagency uh, that may not be homeland security specific. Uh, how do we make sure that those things are thought about? Uh, and then lastly, what new tactics, techniques, uh, other things can we employ and deploy uh, to enlarge our abilities? Uh, and uh, as we do all of this, uh, always being uh, confronted with very difficult questions about not just where does homeland security and the national security begin, uh, but where does homeland security uh, end and privacy begin? Uh, where do uh, programs, policies, initiatives that we are undertaking uh, possibly be viewed as infringing on other constitutional rights, and how do we make sure uh, that uh, we uh, are making decisions and making, that, and making that balance in a calculated way, in an intentional way, not uh, uh, being accidental or careless with some of the vast powers uh, that we may have. Uh, so uh, these are all extremely easy areas. Uh, there are very clear answers. Uh, there's always a right and a wrong. Uh, and, by the way, and if you believe that, uh, you probably shouldn't be the Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, but in any event, that very briefly uh, gives you a synopsis of some of the work that we are doing in the international sphere. Uh, but as Professor Smith said, um, we also, uh, in addition to terrorism prevention, have uh, some of the other major areas that you've heard about, border security, immigration enforcement, and of course, uh, disaster preparation and response uh, under our wings as well. Uh, so it's more than enough to keep us busy, and uh, it's something I'm very passionate in speaking about. So thank you for having me here today. Microphones, uh, you can please line up. Um. Far away. Hello, uh, my name is Lincoln Mitchell, and I'm from Oklahoma. And my question to you is just how would how do you feel about the Arizona illegal immigration law and what would be your ideal solution to illegal immigration both for illegal immigrants who are coming over and those who are already here. Well, I think uh, uh, I think the courts have spoken on the Arizona immigration law at least uh, at least the Ninth Circuit has and we supported the Department of Justice in that lawsuit to um, say that it infringed on uh, the federal government's ability to have primacy in the immigration arena. Uh, so it's, um, uh, it, it was a law too far, but it is understandable that states are acting. Why? Because Congress hasn't acted. And the current immigration law doesn't match our nation's needs, uh, and it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't take into account uh, the different circumstances that uh, immigrants have. It's, it's too hard to become a legal immigrant, uh, and uh, we have too many restrictions. We don't have enough visas uh, for, for 
um, students, for uh, certain types of workers and the like. Uh, we we uh, have wait, waiting lists that are years and years long in other countries. To, you know, our country is a great magnet. We always have been. Uh, so the, the ultimate solution is for Congress to begin uh, really taking up the question of immigration. Um, do I think they're going to do that anytime uh, soon? Uh, probably not. Uh, much as we wish they would, we're, we're ready at the drop of a hat to, to come work collaboratively with them on that. Uh, but until they do, uh, it's our job to enforce uh, the law that we have and do it in a smart way, really trying to focus priorities in, in a reasonable way. And that's what, we're, that's what we are doing. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'm Betsy Cooper. I'm a law student from Buffalo, New York, and my question is also about immigration. Um, one of the different things about the immigration area and Homeland Security compared to other things like uh, terrorism prevention might be that there's also a benefit side. Uh, in your department, you do you know, integration and citizenship and sort of more of the positive things, which is great, but also sort of strangely under the heading of Homeland Security. So as some advocates have proposed separating those uh, positions out into a different department or agency, and I was just wondering your thoughts on that idea. Yeah, it is, it is kind of interesting that we have, um, the, it's called Citizenship and Immigration Services, which is the legalization part uh, of immigration. You know, I could argue it both ways, um, but here's the deal. It's in the department. Uh, I don't think Congress has the appetite to change that. Uh, there is a certain logic to having the enforcement on the illegal side together with the um, uh, opportunities under the legal side. We really see it all. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, my job is to see how we can make those things work as smoothly as possible and smooth the way as much as we can for legal uh, immigration. One of the things we uh, have done, by the way, is uh, set up a consolidated website for students who are international students who um, are uh, here under a, a student visa and they want to stay or what have you, and uh, to, to get that information out and be interactive with them. It's an interactive website so that they can uh, begin working on that process, hopefully not the day before graduation. Uh, mm -hmm. which is too late, by the way. So, but there is a process that we can work with them on. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Josh Silverstein. I'm a law student from New Jersey. I wanted to ask you about cybersecurity, and I, I think it's clear that this is both a state and a non-state threat, and I wanted to know whether there are different ways that the department's gearing up to confront those similar but quite different threats. Yeah, uh, and by state, I, I mean whether they're like a national government in origin as opposed to a, an, an individual actor in another country. Uh, and uh, you are right, uh, and you have to think about it both ways and somewhat differently. Uh, is an intrusion and a theft of uh, defense-related secrets, uh, is, is that uh, someone who just wants the technology, um, or is it a foreign country that wants to uh, deploy it? Uh, is um, uh, the uh, intrusion into the control system of a, uh, of a large telecommunications entity, a, an, a, an instance of uh, a, an international competitor, or whether it's somebody trying to attack your infrastructure. Uh, and, we d and I think we do need to think about those things differently. Why? Because the, the state action uh, really leads to more uh, metaphors, acts of war, you know, this is an act of war, how do you do cyber warfare? And you may have heard some of the, sp the speakers from the Pentagon starting to speak in terms of their cyber command, you know, very military in, in uh, depiction. Uh, and that's really state action. Uh, but state action can also implicate homeland security. So uh, I think you can tell by this answer that we really are struggling uh, with that and what how does this work and how does the federal government organize itself uh, because the threats can be so different in nature. Uh, but, but trust me, these things are coming at us by the thousands now and so daily. And there have been some uh, very deep intrusions uh, in the United States. And so how we handle that at the, on the diplomatic side, on the DOD side, security side, uh, it's, really, uh, it's, it's really an area where there's no clear doctrine right now. Thanks. Yeah. 
Hi, I'm uh, Dermot Lynch. I'm a law student as well from Denver, Colorado. So I wanted to ask you about secure communities. Um, you say that secure, secure communities is about targeting the worst of the worst. It seems like only about 20% of the people who get picked up in secure communities really are the worst of the worst, are level one offenders in your parlance. And there are a lot of you know, local police departments, including the New Haven police, that really don't like the idea of being seen in any way as um, enforcing immigration law or having to be co-opted and conscripted into uh, running these ID checks and having to get entangled with immigration and customs enforcement. That's certainly not their priority. So I'm wondering, uh, and also the recent task force that you commissioned seemed evenly divided on whether we should continue even with secure communities. In fact, some members of the committee resigned rather than um, endorsing um, DH, the, the, the committee's ultimate findings. So I'm wondering, first of all, have you in any way taken the advice of those members who really do think this is undermining, um, this is undermining uh, public safety? Uh, and secondly, I was wondering if you could point me to the statutory authority for secure communities, and if you can explain it to me. Yeah. Um, let me first explain for the audience, you may not know what it is, what it is. Uh, it is an interoperability agreement between uh, the department and the FBI. And basically it says that when the FBI runs someone's fingerprints against criminal databases, uh, they also uh, run them against immigration databases. Uh, and if someone is in the country illegally, and uh, these are people who've been booked into jails and prisons, uh, if they're in the country illegally, before they are released back into the public, ICE has the opportunity to come over or to flag them and make a decision whether to pick them up or not. Uh, whether to hold them in detention or not. Uh, ICE is Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And the whole goal is, and, 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 and I'll tell you, I, I think secure communities uh, is really the answer to a, a big problem that existed. And I speak as someone who was raised in New Mexico and lived my adult life in Arizona. I'm a border person. But that is that the criminal justice system would handle somebody and then release them back in the community and nobody would know and they were here illegally. Uh, and there was, no, there was no connection between the two legal systems, both founded on, by the way, the rule of law. Uh, and what Secure Communities does is through an interoperability agreement fix that issue. It doesn't uh, uh, require an opt-in, uh, nor does it uh, ultimately have an opt-out. It will be uh, in every jail that's using the FBI databases, ultimately by 2013, will have this uh, linkage made. Uh, and it has permitted us to make uh, some really radical change, and that is, uh, when, I, when I came in, uh, in, into this position, uh, if you looked at the composition of who was being detained and removed from our country, we detain and remove about 400,000 people a year. That's, that's how much we have money for. That's how much the courts have the, the room for. Uh, uh, it was very ad hoc, uh, and, it, uh, and, and what we are seeing now uh, is that uh, over half of the individuals who are detained and removed this year, over half will have actual criminal convictions, and two-thirds of the remainder will fit other um, uh, uh, priorities that we have, uh, i.e., we found them right at the border, so we don't want them to turn, you know, we want to turn them back. Uh, they are fugitives from an existing warrant. Uh, they have multiple offenses uh, on the immigration side. Uh, so we, using secure communities as one of our tools, have been able to finally put some priorities into immigration enforcement that didn't exist uh, before. Uh, nobody has questioned the statute authority for such an interoperability agreement. Uh, can I give you the, the USC site off the top of my head? No, but there has been uh, no lawsuit or litigation brought there, and since we've been sued on everything else, I think it would have been raised. Um, but uh, I ask people to, to uh, step back and really look at what Secure Communities is and what it permits us to do and it really permits us in, a, in an area of extraordinary difficulty uh, where you have 10 million people in the country illegally, probably, where you can only remove 400,000 a year to act like prosecutors and set priorities. And then, because if one of your priorities is to find people who are violating laws in addition to the immigration laws, the logical place to start looking for them is in jails and prisons. And that's what Secure Communities allows us to do. Thank you. Thank you a lot.
Hi, uh, my name is Jason Toops. I'm a sophomore economics student. Um, my question is about cybersecurity. Uh, you, you mentioned the need to protect infrastructure, and I know the DOD has been saying similar things. Um, however, given the fact that a lot of the nation's infrastructure is owned and run by private companies, how will the department work with these private companies to provide security before the attack without infringing on, say, free trade you know, principles? Right. Um, this is actually something that's being hashed out uh, and will be hashed out in the Congress because uh, the, the Senate has a cyber bill and the House is going to have a cyber bill. Uh, and one of the issues is, sh should private companies, particularly those who operate critical infrastructure, be mandated by law to do certain things? Should they be incentivized somehow to do certain things, i.e., if they do certain things, they would have a safe harbor from litigation, uh, uh, for example? Uh, or should you just leave it to the market and, and uh, decide that the, uh, they will go to where the market gives them the best answer? Uh, the uh, Senate bill uh, is more of a, what I would call a heavy incentive bill. It's not a mandate bill. Uh, the House bill, as it came out of committee the other day, is more a free market bill. Uh, and so that very interesting question about how those two systems interact or how those two different approaches to the problem uh, uh, should be addressed. That's going to be, uh, uh, you know, hashed out uh, in the Congress. Uh, from our standpoint, uh, I take the incentive uh, point of view. I think you start there before you go to a mandate uh, uh, and then see what happens. Uh, but I don't think you, given the importance and given the kinds of intrusions we're seeing and also some of the behaviors we have already seen, uh, I would not be confident that the market itself is a sufficient protector. Thank you. Yeah. My name's Sean Tan, and I'm a master's student in international relations from Malaysia. And my question is, we all know that um, since 9-11, there's not been a successful terrorist attack on the United States. And I was wondering, and you talked about the seemingly random nature in which the underwear bomber was foiled. My question is, is this because it is the fact that there hasn't been a successful attack since 9-11. Is that because um, we've just been really lucky, or is it because of the great system the Department of Homeland Security has set down? And if it's the former, and, or, or the former to a very large extent, then how much longer do you think our luck can hold out? Well, I think um, uh, a couple of things. Uh, one is, um, uh, every time there is somebody who gets through the layers, um, it gives us the ability to, to fix things retroactively. Like, as I said, we've already joined now the systems that were held on this side of the ocean to the systems held abroad. Uh, that is a huge layer of protection that didn't exist before. But just use the 9-11 attack as a before and after. Uh, if you look at the world prior to September 11, uh, the, the, the intelligence gathering that was focused on uh, uh, homeland-oriented uh, al-Qaeda activities, not nearly as strong as today. Uh, visas, uh, visa security, and not nearly as strong uh, as they are today. These, these guys all traveled uh, with visas. Um, a lot more uh, controls or information about people who are traveling certain routes uh, that may have picked up some of these uh, guys today that wasn't had before. Uh, what you can get on an airport, on an airplane, obviously different. Um, uh, flight schools, uh, background checks for foreign students at flight schools weren't done before, done now. Uh, even uh, to the point of uh, before 9-11, uh, the cockpit didn't have a door, it was just a curtain. Uh, and now, of course, there's a hardened door so that nobody can weaponize an, air an airplane anymore. So before and after. Uh, and, and so every time there's, there's been an attempt, there's also been a, a response and a fix. And there's, we're always thinking ahead in terms of what more needs to be done uh, and, and uh, how to do it most efficiently and effectively. Uh, so uh, there have been other attempts, uh, other things that have been thwarted, uh, some that have not made it into uh, the press, but others have, uh, the Times Square uh, uh, 
bomber, uh, a guy named Zazi out of Den Denver. The student was from Denver just a minute ago. Denver. All right. <laughs> Home of Zazi. Okay. Um, uh, uh, yeah, and, and uh, Alaki was from New Mexico. I don't know what's going on out, out, out there, but in any event, um, uh, so, you know, all those things uh, go together. Um, but that's not to say, uh, in, in response to your question, uh, is there a likelihood or is there a possibility that something will still get through or uh, probably more likely something will, will emanate from within the United States itself, a so-called homegrown uh, terrorist or plot. And as, as much as we are doing, we, we can't uh, guarantee that something will not either get through the various layers we have or uh, succeed at, at the homegrown uh, level. Thanks. Yeah. Yes, sir. Madam Secretary, my name is Armando Gnaglia. I'm a sophomore in the college, and I was born in Caracas, Venezuela. And um, in your, on the topic of better enforcement of our immigration laws, uh, in your August 18th letter to Senator Dick Durbin, uh, you mentioned- To who, I'm sorry? To Senator Durbin. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that there are 300,000 cases uh, currently in immigration courts, mm -hmm. and that these cases are gonna be reviewed by a joint committee between the Department of Justice and Homeland Security. Mm -hmm. um, on a case-by-case -case basis for review. I was wondering if this uh, committee is already being formed and if, if it is going to be formed, uh, when the, uh, the cases will begin to be reviewed. Yeah, no, the Joint Committee has been well underway. Uh, they're obviously, the problem we're trying to, to solve is uh, uh, when you start saying, look, in the immigration system you should have priorities, uh, what do you do with the fact that the immigration courts were clogged with cases that were low priorities, that were taking the time and the resources that we wanted to spend on higher priority cases? So what do you, what, you know, you can set priorities for new cases coming in, uh, but what do you do with the cases already in the system? Uh, and uh, some of those cases obviously have been uh, pending for several years. I mean, the courts take forever in the immigration arena. Why? Because they're clogged. And what are they clogged with? They're clogged with a lot of really low priority matters uh, that are going to get dismissed at the end anyway. How do we know that? Because we deal with hundreds of thousands of these cases and we know what the outcomes are going to be. Uh, so rather than uh, let them fill up the time and not be able to, to really focus on uh, the high priority docket. Uh, we're now in the process of reviewing the existing cases uh, from the mass, what's called the master docket. And that's 300,000, 320,000 some odd uh, matters. Uh, so there is a joint committee between DHS and the Department of Justice. Uh, they are beginning the process. Uh, they're piloting in a couple, of the, a couple of districts right now to see what works and what doesn't because, and, and you want to do it that way because scalability is an issue and you want to see what works and doesn't work. Uh, but uh, we are well uh, underway on that, uh, that process. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Matthew Kim. I'm a first year graduate student at the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. And um, I actually graduated from Emory University last year where you gave the commencement address. Oh, wow. Um, you get a twofer in one year. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> what are you gonna do? Okay. And, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't attend the commencement address. <laughs> 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 um, I, I was in. I have the DVD, <laughs> so I'll. Uh... Um, but the wonders of YouTube has allowed me to see your very inspirational commencement address. Um, <laughs> Um, I'd like to ask a more of a personal question today. Um, I was watching also the Tuscan Memorial Service where um, you uh, briefly quoted uh, from the Bible, uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, you said, um, those who hope in the Lord will, will renew their strength, they will soar wings like eagles, they will walk and not be faint, they will run and not be weary. Um, I'd like to ask you if you prescribe to a certain religion, and if so, how has your religious faith affected your life and your work? Yeah. What he's referring to is the uh, uh, memorial service in Tucson after the shootings there 
uh, last January where uh, Representative Giffords was critically injured. The chief judge of the district was murdered. Uh, one of her staffers was murdered, several others. It was really a horrible uh, situation. And uh, the president and I went out there and, and uh, participated in a memorial service together. Uh, and I did, uh, you have a good memory, I did um, quote the book of Isaiah in my remarks. Um, and uh, I am a Protestant, I am a Christian, and uh, I try to uphold and live my life by those beliefs. Thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, uh, my name is Aaron Gertler. I'm a freshman in Yale College, and my question relates to cybersecurity. Uh, given that it seems like uh, China right now is sort of almost, you would say, building an army of people who are very skilled in uh, cybersecurity as well as offensive um, cyber attacks. Do you believe the United States um, is currently training uh, skilled computer users at a rate um, that will allow us to counter the um, effects of this training by China over the next few years? And if not, do you believe that um, the United States education system could do more to develop um, a number of skilled experts on cybersecurity that would enable us to counter this sort of buildup? Yeah. Um no and yes. Uh, no, I don't think we're training enough. Uh, I think that uh, this is an area of great national concern. Uh, you know, I'm just thinking about DHS. Uh, we're trying to hire a thousand people right now in cybersecurity, uh, and we can't find them uh, that that can meet our our needs. Uh, so there's a huge market out there. Uh, there's a huge need. Uh, we need to have a national effort in this regard. Uh, everybody's online, everybody's on the net. Uh, all of our critical infrastructure is cyber dependent. Uh, this has got to be something that is, is much higher in the public's consciousness, I believe, than it, than it currently is. Uh, so no, we're not, uh, I think, uh, prepared uh, enough. Uh, and uh, yes, I would agree with you that our education system needs to do more in this, re in this area. Um, that uh, I think um, uh, it, it's, I, I, I wonder whether we have enough uh, educators in the system who are uh, familiar with concepts of cybersecurity to be able to help, but we certainly have uh, uh, we certainly have huge, huge, huge needs in this regard. Now, with respect to China um, or uh, attacks emanating from China, I don't, I must say, I don't get too concerned about numbers. Uh, you know, there's, in some respects, they may always have more absolute numbers. The question is, do you have the right kind of uh, uh, individuals properly trained who can do all the work you need done? Um, and, and, and there, we, we still have efforts to make. Thank you. Madam Secretary, uh, my name is Michael Magic. I'm a junior political science and Russian studies major. Uh, I was wondering, perhaps in light of Governor Perry's recent uh, comments regarding the situation, if you could offer some insight into how high a priority you feel the, uh, the Mexican drug cartels are and what, if any, solutions you're exploring at the moment regarding that problem. Yeah. Well, Mexico, as you know, has been riven by huge violence caused by these drug cartels, and they are large organizations. They, they've been around a long time, but they've gotten larger. They've gotten more complex in terms of their organizational structure. They are, you know, you, you could say that there are several states of Mexico, particularly northern Mexico, uh, where the rule of law is at risk of being lost. Uh, to the cartels. So this is a really dangerous situation uh, on the southern side uh, of our border. And we're working a lot with Mexico on that and with the Calderon administration. There are a number of efforts that have been undertaken uh, with them. Uh, what, what's interesting is that the level of violence right on the other side of the Rio Grande or right on the other side of the border uh, is a very low. Uh, and in fact, some of the safest communities in the United States are right on our southern border, El Paso, for example, right across the bridge from Juarez, Mexico, one of the most violent cities in the world. Uh, I don't know the reasons for that, I and mean, there's speculation, and one of the speculation is that uh, the, the, the 
the drug organizations uh, do their turf fighting on the Mexican side, but their families live on the U.S. side. That's one explanation. That may explain a little bit of it. Um, we have uh, very strong law enforcement on the U.S. side uh, that doesn't, you know, uh, we'll, we'll be prepared to, to act very strongly if something creeps over. I think that may be another one, a deterrent effect, in other words. So uh, a lot of reasons for that, but uh, we're down there all the time, and we're in touch with the sheriffs down there all the time, and we're watching that like a hawk because the last thing we need in this country is uh, spillover violence of the type uh, we've seen in Mexico coming into our own southern states. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Secretary. Uh, my name is Jonathan Yang. I'm a junior in the college from Southern California. Uh, in your opening remarks, you put Homeland Secur uh, Security squarely in the umbrella of national security more broadly. Uh, but looking at, say, the political, logistical difficulty, if not impossibility, of plugging every hole, as well as the expansion of drone strikes and military action, other sort of preemptive, offensive, pre uh, proactive action, how would you characterize the current balance in U.S. national security policy between defense and offense, and do you see that shift changing uh, as threats evolve, looking further down the line? Well, I think... Um you know, one of the things that we've seen is the uh, ability uh, with technology to uh, be able to uh, take out uh, some of the, the, those who have uh, and are immediate dangers to the United States uh, with having, without having to have a, a full commitment of ground troops. Uh, that's, that's a major change, um, and I think we have to be uh, careful uh, and, and how that's used. Uh, I, I think we have to be very thoughtful and by which those attacks are sanctioned. Uh, but they do give us some, some additional protections that we didn't have even a few years ago. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, given, given what's out there and the type of threats emanating against the United States and the continued and expressed desire to attack the West and to attack uh, our aviation system in particular, and that, that's continually held up as like the gold standard. Um, I, I think that some of these uh, tactics uh, are, are well employed here. Thank you. You bet. Uh, hello, Madam Secretary. My name is Megan Fitzpatrick. I'm from Buffalo, New York, and I'm a graduate student in public health here, so my question is maybe a little different now. Um, but my group and I, we were recently discussing um, the movie Contagion, and uh, as well as the 1918 flu pandemic and the disastrous consequences that an infection can cause. And um, we kept in mind the gentleman, the American citizen with MDR-TB, who a few years ago boarded a plane and put a lot of people at very high risk. And um, we were unaware of any possible measure to detain him or um, any ways that Homeland Security could have protected against such an incident where someone selfishly or maliciously decides to bring a highly infectious and um, difficult to treat or potentially fatal disease into our country. And so I was wondering if the Department of Homeland Security um, currently has, you think, strong enough measures to prevent such a contingency, or if you think that strengthening such measures would be an invasion of privacy that's just simply unacceptable for our country. Well, yeah, and I, I can actually remember a, a case where a guy who had tuberculosis uh, was trying to uh, come from Canada into Arizona, uh, actually, and intentionally. Uh, and so you do have occasional cases of that sort. Um, that's where, uh, assuming you have knowledge, you know, assuming you're not going to stand at the gate to the air, airport and give everybody a TB test or some other kind of blood test, which, you know, I think we've gone about as far as we can go on that score. Um, but assuming you're not going to do that, you have to have some kind of prior knowledge. But if you have prior knowledge, uh, then we have some combined authorities with the Centers for Disease Control, the public health statutes of the country, uh, that give us some latitude on, on who we let in. It becomes trickier when it's somebody who's actually a U.S. citizen, and they have left the country and now they want to come back. Uh, and that's where uh, you have to use a combination of persuasion and uh, incentives, uh, but it, it, it's, that can be a very difficult situation if somebody doesn't want to cooperate. Uh, and it's a, it's, you are right to say it's a little gap in the, in the system. I haven't seen the movie yet. Is it any good? 
I haven't seen it either. My friends have just been talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon. I, my name is Katie Aragon. I'm a sophomore in the college from San Diego. And I wanted to ask you specifically about asylum seekers um, and the long and traumatizing process that they often are subjected to once they're here in US borders. Um, I spoke to a woman from Guatemala who had come here seeking asylum. asylum. Um, she was fleeing from a very abusive home situation and she was basing her case on the fact that if she returned to Guatemala, she would face death. Um, and from that point on, she spent about two years in a private detention center, privately owned, um, which is paid per head um, by the government. And she ended up having to effectively give her daughter over to friends of friends to care for while she was um, going through this process. I'm wondering if you could speak to the possible um, conflict you, that exists there between these private detention centers um, and if there are any efforts being made to make this process faster and more just. Yeah, uh, well, I've already talked about um, uh, some of the things we're doing to streamline the process. Uh, and, you know, on asylum, you know, asylum is, a, is uh, you know, that is governed by law. Uh, and there's a fair amount of case law, particularly in the Ninth Circuit, on, on asylum and asylum claims. Uh, there's always the possibility of someone being uh, paroled in on, on a humanitarian uh, basis, but those, those, those claims are, uh, uh, or that exercise of discretion is limited as, as well, um, because uh, many, many, many of the asylum seekers uh, always have compelling cases. These are, you know, immigration systems are, are uh, you know, can, can, there are hardships, and, and I keep telling people, look, even when there is immigration reform, and I really hope there is, because this statute and the statutes we operate under really are not uh, well-serving uh, right now, uh, but uh, even when there is, there will still be individual cases like the one you, you described. Uh, now, with respect to uh, the detention System, the detention facilities themselves. Yes, we have contracted with private uh, detention space, uh, but one of the first things we did when we came in was to uh, institute a whole, uh, a whole very extensive menu of detention reforms, uh, and we applied them to our private vendors as, as well as when we contract with a public jail or, or what have you. Uh, and we cut off some of our private vendors who didn't meet our standards, and we are constantly auditing our private vendors and inspecting them and making sure that um, those detention uh, centers meet standards for health, um, both physical and mental, by the way, uh, and, and other standards that we've set for them. Thank you. You bet. Hi, my name is Daniel Simon. I'm a student at the law school. Uh, my question is about the, <coughs> excuse me, aviation security and passenger screening. Um, so you mentioned in an earlier answer about the responses that uh, DHS has uh, taken to address some of the issues in preventing terrorism in the aviation system. But all of those responses, so at least to the public eye, seem to have been reactive. So there's Richard Reed, take off your shoes. Uh, bombs and printer cartridges, you can't send printers. You know, underwear bomber and you install machines that look under people's underwear. So um, it seems that like if you install these measures the day after um, a method, a tactic is tried, it's exactly one day too late. Does the department uh, view this kind of reactive screening strategy on this case-by-case and method-by-method basis as something that's going to continue going forward? Is it going to change to more proactive measures? And specifically, what is the department's attitude towards things like behavioral profiling? Toward what, sorry? Behavioral profiling of passengers like kind of more along the lines of, uh, the, not, I don't want to say the Israeli system because that involves a very kind of expensive and big thing, but I've heard some discussion of taking some of the behavioral profiling aspects of the Israeli system and using that for um, screening passengers rather than more of kind of an x-ray and pat-down sort of basis. Uh, I couldn't understand the question. Uh, can you back up from the mic just a minute and let me get to, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, can you hear me okay now? Yeah, a little bit. Speak more slowly. Let me see if I can hear this. Sure. I, I was asking specifically in terms of changing methods and overall strategy of passenger screening. Mm -hmm. Is there an idea of moving forward with the existing strategy on a per-tactical screening basis, screening of the person's body, or 
does the department have any thoughts about moving towards more of a behavioral profiling system? Slightly, I got you. Okay. Slightly more akin to the Israeli system. I got you. I got you. Okay, sorry. Okay, this is what we're doing. First of all, uh, yeah, we do look backwards when something has happened and, and make adjustments accordingly. Uh, now, with respect to the underwear bomber, we were already in the process of deploying the, the new AIT machines well before then. We'd already been buying them. Why? Because the intel was telling us that the, the, the terrorists uh, knew that they needed, if they could use an explosive that didn't contain metal, that was a powder or a gel, uh, they uh, increased their ability to get through our, our last layer of protection, which is the actual gate itself. So the AITs were, looked reactive, but they were really uh, in process. Um, uh, and, we're, and we are looking down uh, the road at a number of things. Um, one of them is doing more risk-based uh, screening. What does that mean? It means that when we have like, prior knowledge about passengers and we can begin characterizing uh, those who are uh, frequent travelers, known travelers, and, and the like, uh, we can begin making decisions about whether they should get exactly the same screening uh, as someone about whom we know nothing or who would fall in a high-risk category. So we are piloting that right now. We already have it in the international realm. It's a program called Global Entry. You can get a card, and it means you voluntarily agree. You pay a fee, and you voluntarily agree to give us some information in exchange for which uh, you get um, accelerated um, through, through the lines uh, with the caveat that there's always a certain amount of random in, in anything that we do. In other words, we'll always do a little bit of random checking. So that's underway. With respect to behavioral screening itself, uh, we actually have undercover officers in many airports now. Um, and they use some of the techniques that are based on uh, what they do in Israel. They use some others uh, uh, as well. Uh, we have found um, in, in looking at this that it is very effective and that there are really good, good practices that can be employed in that arena. So when, you, when you're talking about the airport environment, which is a very complicated environment, and the aviation system, which is a very complicated system, you're, you're talking about many different uh, things that are going on before you get to the airport, while you're at the airport, but before you get to the gate, when you get to the gate and when you get between the gate and the jetway. And there are layers now, some seen, some unseen, all of which are designed to deal with threats uh, that are known or reasonably foreseeable to us. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, my apologies to those of you who are waiting in line. Would you like to take the last one, please? Thank you. Uh, my name is Lorela Praeli, and I'm undocumented. And my question has to do with the Morton memo earlier this year, which was followed by the DHS announcement on August 18th. And my concern stems from the fact that we have not seen a clear implementation plan with the announcement about how dream eligible youth would not be placed in removal proceedings and those, as well as those who are not currently in the system. A good friend of mine, Matias Ramos, um, was put in the super, supervision program about a month after the announcement, which forces, forces him to wear an ankle bracelet and be up against the wall to charge it three hours every day. Um, so my questions are, how will you ensure that people who fit or meet this low priority are in fact given or granted deferred action? And how will you also ensure that as new cases come in, people are actually you know, classified as low priority and not sent back mm -hmm. to countries. Yeah, um, uh, there is guidance going out to OPLA lawyers now at the regional level, and each of them uh, uh, has, has that guidance as to how to review cases and how to look at cases coming in the system. What was interesting is that the, the, the lawyers in the immigration arena um, did not view themselves like assistant U.S. attorneys view themselves. Like assistant U.S. attorneys view themselves as having discretion. You know, an agent brings them a case, they decide whether or not they think it's, it's, it's a priority case, whether it's worthy of a court's time. Uh, priorities are set all through the criminal justice system, and I, I can say that as a federal prosecutor and as a state prosecutor. Every criminal justice system, the pri prosecutors are setting priorities. 
What was happening in the immigration system is it was viewed more administratively. People were just moving cases along, and they took a long time. Uh, and they were not risk-based in the sense that I just talked about how we are, are moving to handle other areas uh, that we're dealing with. Um, and so uh, that we are now in the process and guidance is going out to the field and training is underway now about how to exercise discretion and how to do that in reviewing the current caseload and how to do that in reviewing cases that are becoming into the system. Uh, and we're piloting uh, so, uh, some of that right now in certain uh, districts, see how it works, what works, doesn't work, uh, and, but we will very soon be going national. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. You've been great. Thank you. Thank you.